Good morning. Today we have assembled here 
to celebrate the Anti Microbial Awareness Week at AIMS New Delhi. As we know, antimicrobial resistance is the one which in which is actually impacting the sustainable development goals. United Nations came with these goals in order to have a global blueprint for a better, more equitable, more sustainable life on our planet. However, antibiotic resistance is the one which is actually impacting all the SDGs and therefore affecting health as well as economy. WHO has given the response and in response, the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance was formulated with five strategic objectives to improve the awareness of antimicrobial resistance, to strengthen the surveillance and research, to reduce the incidence of infection, optimal use of antimicrobial agents and ensure the sustainable environment and investment in the countries. So, World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, which actually started on 18th and will be till 24th November, is to spread this awareness to stop the resistance. As we know that there are many causes of antibiotic resistance, over-prescribing, patients taking antibiotic as and when they want, not completing the course, and also use of antibiotics in animal and agriculture. So, these are the areas which are actually leading to emergence of drug resistance. If you see that AMR could, could actually reduce the GDP substantially and the data has shown that how it is actually affecting the poor countries or the developing countries. And therefore, it is very, very important to understand that it is not just a single problem of AMR, it, it is actually affecting all the sustainable development goals. If you see the sustainable development goal number one, no poverty, zero hunger, which is actually affecting the good health and well-being of the people, which is affecting the good work and economic growth because of the ill health and reducing inequality and ultimately the coordination of different sectors, whether it is CDC, WHO, um, societies of microbiology abroad and in our country, all need to join hands to combat the antimicrobial resistance. So, some antimicrobials, which I already said, they are used to treat infection in animals. So, therefore, one health approach to stop this overuse and reduce antimicrobial resistance is very, very important. And therefore, this one health response to antimicrobial resistance is the need of the R, which is actually affecting all the sustainable development goals. So, in order to tackle this problem, I think we need to join hands clinicians, microbiologists, nursing and all the staff need to join hands in order to curb this and create an awareness. So today we are going to have a series of lectures by Department of Microbiology where we will be covering the different antimicrobial resistance problems in bacterial, fungal, tuberculosis and also talk about antimicrobial stewardship program. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning to respected Dean, ma'am, all the faculty and everybody. Today we are here to discuss about the awareness of, about the antibiotics and there cannot be a bigger and challenging topic which, re which is required at the time. We have learned so much from COVID. This is another pandemic. It, it is something like that which everybody has to contribute. Everybody means everybody. It's not only the healthcare worker. So the theme for this Antimicrobial Awareness Week is preventing antimicrobial resistance together. So uh, we will talk about these. As we all know, this week is celebrated from 18 to 24 November as told, and it's a fixed date. It encourages the best practices for control of antibiotic use for general public, for healthcare workers, for policy makers, to prevent and contain the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So under these headings, we will cover these topics. So as I was saying, this is one of the pandemic alongside COVID, which we have seen. So these uh, uh, figure shows what's the magnitude of this pandemic. So uh, the, the red dot in the center can show 
current it's currently approximately 0.7 million cases are there but the currently the, the highest number of cases which we see is due to cancer approximately 10 million and this amr if we, if it keeps on going by the current rate it will reach and even cross that figure by 2040 even combining all the diseases which we are feared of diabetes diarrhea road traffic suicide they they even combining all those doesn't come anywhere near the amr magnitude if we will not try to do our best to control this so amr we as per who we know it's the resistance of microorganism to antimicrobial drug that was initially effective for treatment of infections caused by it it occurs when bacteria parasites we mainly talk about bacteria but also parasites viruses or fungi they change to protect themselves from the effect of antimicrobial drugs so antibiotics they are a unique medicine so but there is one thing that is tragedy of commons in which we we one one individual is benefited but in the larger picture it is ultimately leading to uh, concerns for the larger community so so uh, this is the picture with the antibiotics how has antimicrobial resistance developed it's basically due to it's a natural phenomena so bacteria they are the living organism so whatever they will be feared of antibiotics are there to kill those microorganisms so, so whatever will come to kill those to harm those bacteria they will respond by producing certain things to defend themselves this is basically survival of fittest so this is a continuous natural phenomena this will keep on happening so it's not that we will just keep on developing newer antibiotics and we will control this we have to have a a collective approach to control all these infections so what are the basic causes of antibiotic resistance if, if you see through the diagram there's one important point is over prescription of antibiotics we will dwell on this patients not finishing their treatment overuse of antibiotics in livestock this we will discuss poor infection control lack of hygiene and poor sanitation it can transmit the infections through uh, uh, through cross contaminations and lack of new antibiotics being developed and lack of new rapid test. So how all these things lead to increase in AMR? We, this we will discuss. Another thing is it is it is entering the food chain through the uh, through uh, the antimicrobials that are given to food producing animals and lead to drug resistance bacteria in animals. The drug resistance bacteria can spread to the environment and to the food and taken by the human being and can lead to spread of infections as depicted this can be only controlled this chain can be controlled by one health approach so if simply we see bacteria there is indiscriminate or misuse of antibiotics they lead to a pathogen which present in different ways for production of resistant lead to uh, uh, drug resistant pathogens this we all uh, understand what are the basic mechanisms through which resistance can happen plasmid or the cl chromosomal mediated just a picture how uh, what are the different mechanisms through which it can lead to uh, resistance so in in a simple language what happens there are a lot of bacteria which are there and few are resistant when antibiotic kill these uh, sensitive bacteria they also kill good bacteria and lead to uh, lead to a uh, flourish of this infection and the antibiotic resistant bacteria they grow and take over and they also transfer these infections to other human beings so through the common practices we have to control all these things with all this the bacteria is knocking out the antibiotic and what i said you you don't have to just thinking that new antibiotic will come and we have to control this we have to uh, control this through the collective approach of different mechanisms different antibiotic stewardship technique which will be discussed so basically how it spreads if we give antibiotic antibiotics are given to patients which can result in drug resistant bacteria developing in gut and patient attend hospitals or clinic these drug resistant bacteria they spread to other patients through poor hygiene and unclean facilities these drug resistant bacteria they spread to the general public and this way it can it spreads among the different communities uh, just a brief that how this antibiotics have uh, there in the larger picture in the pre 20th century there was nothing like that and no antibiotics were there and there were a large number of people were dying due to this so first antimicrobial were developed but that was not the idea in 1928 alexander fleming discovered penicillin and sulfonamides came into picture in 1935 and in 1941 that is uh, flore and uh, ernst they worked on the clinical application of penicillin this was a revolution and in 1945 nobel prize was awarded to these three the fleming Sir, Sir Alexander Fleming, Ernst and Flore for their work on antibiotics. 
but soon will develop and penicillin resistant bacteria as soon as the antibiotics were developing we can see methicillin uh, MR, uh, the, as had uh, developed we developed mrs and, and there was lack of antibiotic production in the later part of years this picture uh, signifies in the in this era uh, uh, at the top part uh, at the upper part we can see there is a development of antibiotics soon we can see there is a correspondence in the development of resistance so as we see uh, so sulfonamide was developed in 935 and resistance developed to it tetracycline developed tetracycline resistance also developed in this scenario so in the later part there is lack of antibiotic production and this also is leading to control of this infection this data shows in the later part of years there is lack of uh, decline in antibiotic production which is leading to uh, lack of options which are there this picture also signifies as soon as the antibiotics are developing this dot shows that when they are developed and this arrowhead shows as soon as they are getting the resistance so it as soon as they are developed they are, the antibiotics are developed they are leading to resistance after some years it shows erythromycin vancomycin took some time for the development of resistance but all the drugs as soon as they are developed they are developing the resistance pattern and so we have to look for something why this is happening we have to delay these processes for development of resistance and this thing was uh, well predicted by the great man sir alexander fleming it made the uh, cautionary statement in 1945 in new york times resistance is not new the thoughtless person playing with the penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of a man who succumbed to infection with the penicillin resistant organism he even predicted it before developing it and in uh, 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 in in his in lecture he told that it is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the lab by exposing them to concentration not sufficient to kill them and the same thing has occasionally happened in the body the time may come when penicillin can be brought by anyone in the shop then there is a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non lethal quantities of drug make them resistant so this was well predicted when even the penicillin resistance didn't, uh, didn't came in the picture so this tells that they are the uh, living organism they will uh, protect themselves from any danger like we do so it's a common phenomena so looking at how how big a problem it is for us for the world this is an uh, icmr uh, amr network through which we are also the part uh, of th that network and it shows approximately 40 to 50 percent sensitivity is maintained throughout for uh, different antibacterials in the in among these klebsiella are the more resistant so it requires a collective picture resistance is getting worse with time this is again it is showing for acinetobacter baumannii we are seeing high number of mdr approximately 80 to 90 percent high number of xgr strains this picture shows with the time resistance pattern is coming if this is sensitivity pattern it's between 20 to 40 percent for the listed drugs so it's a very uh, difficult picture to uh, see and how to go about similarly in the klebsiella they are also responding almost the acinetobacter way so we are seeing 20 to 50 percent sensitivity pattern in different areas in our setup with the tertiary care center we are getting lesser sensitivity and we are seeing the picture something like this initially it was the left picture it moved on to the right picture then it is moving on to the extreme right picture so this scenario is quite common in our labs we see the drug and the organism which are only sensitive to cholesterol the higher generation tetracyclines like the tetracycline uh, uh, so only these two or one or two drugs are coming for amino glycosides we are seeing 70 to 80 percent resistance for carbapenems we are seeing 40 to 50 percent resistance for methicillin we are seeing mrsa 40 to 50 percent so this picture is there uh, uh, and we have to do something only developing antibiotic will not be the only solution so what i said what india is doing through that we, this is a amrs and that is antimicrobial resistance surveillance network and there are 20 regional centers which are keep on adding and there are four nodal centers we are one of also one of the nodal center for this through which we collect all this information and generate all those data which which was shown earlier uh, that was india the similar it's a global phenomenon so as i said it's a uh, it shows the carbapenem resistance among acinetobacter it's higher it's on the higher side in india but it's there all over almost everywhere so it's a global picture it requires a global 
COVID is an exact example which should be followed for AMR. So it should be a one nation, whatever resources are available in any setup, they should be given to the all the concerned areas. It's not that we will work in pocket areas that we will not give some drug is developed somewhere, we should not give it to the other areas. It should be a collective thing because AMR and the resistance pathogen don't uh, uh, define those boundaries. So how can we define the boundaries? So the, through the pictures for the general information, I just want to so show these antibiotics, they kill bacteria. So they treat many bacterial illness. Let's see for most of the respiratory infections, we, will, we give antibiotics. So antibiotics, they give bacteria, they break down the cell wall, but they have no effect on viruses. But we, as soon as somebody has an upper respiratory tract infections, we push to give antibiotics. So that approach is required to be curtailed down. And another point is antibiotics need work to time. Another phenomenon is as soon as somebody is getting get it uh, asymptomatic this start to stop the antibiotics but not this phenomena should be stopped first in our mind in our practices let's say day one this picture is there a microorganism there we prescribe the antibiotics on the day five the course is 10 days let's say so on the five days we will see approximately 80 percent pathogens are covered and medication taken for full course of treatment at the end infection is cured but if we will not follow this picture what will happen that we will just see antibiotic resistance over time, the bacteria develop the ability to survive with drugs. So what are the causes of resistance? Three things I will talk about. Unnecessary use, we will see with the example, quitting treatment too soon also, and unnecessary use of broad spectrum medication. So broad spectrum medication is initially used when we don't have idea what is the etiology of that. So, so we, we should aim at shifting from the empirical therapy to a targeted therapy. Empirical will always be a broad spectrum, but broad spectrum always lead to increase in chances of resistance. As we should target to shift from broad spectrum antibiotic to narrow spectrum antibiotic, and that can only happen through development of point of care test diagnostic stewardship. So we should have such test which just says to us whether bacterial infection is there or not. Even if we get to know that this patient is not bacterial infection, is not having bacterial infection, we can stop the antibiotics. That will also solve a lot of purposes. Apart from that, we, we should have a point of care test which decide, which gives an early decision for this. So with the, with the few examples, we will see, let's say a patient has sore throat. Without testing, he was prescribed penicillin, just thinking it's a streptococcus. But it was a viral infection. It caused by virus. He also has bacteria in his sinus, but these bacteria are not leading to any disease, but it's mainly due to virus. So if you will give penicillin in this case, so these bacteria, the susceptible bacteria, they are killed off. A few hardly survivors, you can see, they survive and they will survive due to develop. They will fight with these antibiotics and produce the resistance mechanism. So these will become resistant, but as such, they have no role till now in the disease. But, but whenever uh, the resistant survivors multiply and the, so finally, if you treat next time with the penicillin, the patient will not respond to it. And the patient become now become a penicillin resistant bacteria where nothing was required in such a case. This is one example. Another example, let's say the patient was diagnosed, that is incomplete treatment. Let's say a patient came with a sore throat and fever. He was diagnosed with streptococcus and uh, the patient takes medicine for three days, but she requires to take 10 days for oral penicillin and uh, for that. And she start to feel fine. Her parent decides it's okay to stop. So that falls with incomplete, let's say day zero antibiotics were prescribed and symptoms started to improve on day three and the, and but they stopped the treatment so meanwhile the survivors start keeping uh, uh, they keep on multiplying on day 10 day 10 there will be more of resistant pathogens so these one of these two phenomena they will be covered in antimicrobial stewardship right dose right duration these are the very critical aspects to control that is you should not stop the treatment as soon as uh, lesser uh, in the lesser duration whatever is it prescribed and another is the first one where it is not required you should try to control try to control with conservative methods respiratory infections uh, resistant infection they require if if they become resistant they require higher dose they require longer treatment they are more expensive medications and iv medications hospitalization these are the consequences of if the if the pathogen become resistant why we generally use antibiotics overuse antibiotics from the patient point of view it's a pre notion that antibiotics will help them recover soon that's this fear should be alleviated by a by a healthcare provider. 
they expect antibiotics if they have been given them before they they think that somebody is uh, in the same condition was given has given antibiotic it responded they just want antibiotic at that point of time physicians they think patient expect antibiotic at the first go they give antibiotic they, they are concerned about patient satisfaction not about the ideal thing which is required diagnosis is difficult means it takes time they cannot wait for so long for uh, that's why a, a, a told point of care test has the major role and time pressure to uh, to treat the patient early so they prescribe antibiotic at the initial time so these are the things why we use what can patient do in these condition they can ask healthcare provider to explain the diagnosis don't they should not insist on antibiotics they should remember that there can be different causes for the disease and that's fine but if they are prescribed antibiotics they they should take every dose unless you are specifically directed otherwise never save antibiotics for later illness it's not that some things have uh, uh, had has remained and there with you should re, you should keep them for any future illness never share antibiotics between family members it's not that we have taken one antibiotic similar thing we should give it that should be a prescription base but these practices are commonly followed so what can healthcare provide providers do they should explain the thing ask the patient about their expectations that whether the disease can be conservatively managed they should stick to the treatment guidelines they should not succumb to the different pressures which are there to treat the patient early so this was uh, regarding uh, regarding what are the issues how we can control this will be dwelt in different lectures but this is a picture which says that what are the different strategies we can use and how we are using uh, in different things there should be research and development of new therapeutics that means new point of care test new antibiotics and availability of these antibiotics throughout implementation of antimicrobial stewardship along with hospital infection control expanded surveillance which we are doing through amr network rapid diagnostic i have told elimination of growth promoting antibiotics from animal food which we, we will uh, dwell on just a bit on these sl slides and there is collaboration among throughout the world that is uh, it's a, uh, uh, we should consider the whole world as one so so just a bit about how one health approach can help in uh, in those type of thing that bacteria and the genes they move easily within between human and animals and if the action taken or not taken in one sector it affects other sectors and 70% of the human infectious disease emerged or reemerged in recent de decades are zoonotic this we will try to explain with one example that th one of the common correlates of antibiotics which are used in animals one is ceftriofer which is used for it's a third generation cephalosporin corresponding drugs are the ceftriaxone which are used in human beings so if you use th those drugs they are they are classically important drugs and what happens this is a, a diagram which shows uh, in a study in canada with as as the uh, uh, rate of ceftriofer resistant salmonella these black ones are the salmonella uh, uh, the ceftriofer resistance uh, salmonella and as as these uh, prevalence of it changing the prevalence of incidence of human infection with septifer resistant salmonella is also changing according to that so as soon as as the drug is used in the human anim, in the animals similar correlates are seen in the human beings for that another drug which is there uh, if uh, another example which shows if we reduce the uh, 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 use of these drugs in animals it reduces the chances of infection of similar pathogens another example for these drugs are one is evoparsin which is corresponding to vancomycin but it is given to animals but if it is given to animals it leads to vancomycin resistance in, in humans similarly colistin which is uh given for uh, pathogen for uh, growth as a growth promoter in animals but the good step has been taken this has been banned for uh, animal food industry and it may uh, convert into uh, as polystin is uh, resistance is emerging 1 to 2% we are seeing in setup it may try to uh, it may help in controlling these infections one of the arm was uh, how we can control through amr one of the thing is how we can control through antimicrobial stewardship that will be covered but in that how we have can do with the hospital infection control this is just a uh, uh, what we do in our uh, setup where we do infection control this was uh, uh, like if we can control the infection through hand hygiene that is one picture but if we can also control hospital acquired infections hospital acquired infections compared to community acquired infections are much hardier much resistance so they require higher number higher number and higher 
duration of antibiotics so more chances of production of amr but if you can control these infections from the hospital acquired infection we can control the amr with the hic hospital infection control also this picture just shows the blue one are the compliance before the teaching exercises and the red one is the compliance for the clepsy prevention practices after the intervention so this picture shows as such the as the compliance increase we correspondingly correlated the rates for the clepsy infections so in the in, in before the audit it was before the compliance increase it was somewhere like 7% but as soon as the compliance increased the rate fall to 4 to 5% so if if you can control the hand hygiene if you can promote the hand hygiene promote uh, restrict the transfer of infection and control hospital acquired infection they automatically lead to reduction of use of antibiotics and reduction of amr so this is one arm through which we can target by proper infection control practices proper in uh, each point of infection control another thing is there is a big role of development and availability of new antimicrobials in controlling amr development is fine availability i am targeting but we have seen there are many antibiotics which are available in some parts of world not available in other parts of world so this control should move from pharmaceutical companies to the policy makers for the world so if that can happen then only otherwise some resistance will develop in that area and that will transmit to other area this will keep on happening so we have done some uh, uh, research for the newer antibiotics which currently we don't have one of this is is a newer tetracycline as we all know first generation tetracycline is the tetracycline second generation is doxycycline minocycline third generation are the tegacycline which we have after that we have eravacycline and omadacycline we have done research for that and we have seen they have a much lower resistance pattern compared to the drugs which are there because they counter the resistance mechanism so availability of these drugs will always help us in controlling give us arm to control when we are seeing a picture where only polystyrene tetracycline they are only sensitive will have other drugs which are there to control these infections this is just our data which shows uh, tetracycline is on the left uh, orange is orange one is on the left left side and the paradigm shift we can see in the resistance uh, in the mic to the on the blue side is the eravacycline eravacycline has a much lower mic compared to tetracycline so tetracycline resistance we are seeing but if we have such drugs which are fda approved also in the mic 50 we can see tetracycline has a has a higher mic of 2 when we checked it with efflux pump inhibitor it reduced to 0.5 but eravacycline even in the absence of uh, e flux pump inhibitor has a 0.25 mic where tetracycline and e flux pump inhibitor was having higher mic similar picture was there in mic 90 so this uh, shows that these drugs have a potential to control this infection and tetracycline we see 18% only was sensitive but elavacycline 91% was sensitive so this tells about this drug another drug we checked is the another th third generation kefalosporin that is omadacycline and we have seen 44% of the blood stream infection and 37% of the meningitis cases which were xdr that means in xdr this percentage is a not not a small percentage so uh, answering approximately 40% xdr cases is a big contribution so these drugs can contribute icpamis is another aminoglycoside which is there which we have checked and found sensitivity and another drug is plasomycin we have we, uh, this we could not procure but due to restrictions of transfer but but the, when we characterize the strains we found the ame is this uh, this plasomycin is a new aminoglycoside drug where amicacin gentamicin they are countered by the ames but plasomycin as per literature they they are protected due to the structural modification in the drug they are protected against those ames so we characterize the acinetobacter klebsiella and characterize the uh, ame gene on these and we found if these strains are having these ames the literature sh literature shows that these and ames will not counter plasomycin so if we have this drug we can protect this infection and this is another another drug which is fda approved and uh, which shows but we could not do research on this for actually but we have characterized the strains but availability of these drug that is the de uh, re development of newer drugs but we are seeing the decline in the pipeline and availability of the whatever available drugs are there throughout the world can help this uh, slide was explained by ma'am so i'm not repeating it so it is hitting all the five big things of the uh, sustainable development goals so uh, just to conclude what are the key messages amr they occurs when organism evolves and develop resistance to antimicrobial that should inhibit or destroy it 
is reducing the effectiveness of antimicrobial to treat infections and it is happening now we have to act now few new antimicrobials have been developed misuse overuse and inappropriate use of antimicrobials it contributes to antimicrobial resistance antimicrobial uh, uh, stewardship is one of the important thing and also for microbiological point of view diagnostic stewardship that we should guide for the proper therapy as soon as possible so these are the critical arms uh, role of uh, antimicrobial stewardship it will be discussed so we should combat drug resistance if no action today no action previously that's fine but currently we have to do act, act today and if we will, will not do that there will be no cure tomorrow and with this i conclude that uh, we have to act collectively it's everybody's business it's not one person business thank you A very good morning to everyone. I'm Dr. Nishant Parma from Department of Microbiology at Ames, New Delhi, and I will be talking about antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, now, Dr. Hitendra Gautam has very well covered many aspects related to my topic, uh, but I will try to um, give you some overview of the antimicrobial stewardship, how it is very relevant for all of us. And as, as Dr. Hitendra said, it is no one else's business, it's our business. It's a teamwork we have to do to achieve the goals uh, linked to antimicrobial stewardship and any infection control practices or the antimicrobial misuse related issues we have to tackle. So first, we should know what is stewardship. So stewardship is defined as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. While diagnostic stewardship refers to coordinated guidance and interventions to improve appropriate use of antimicrobial diagnostics to guide therapeutic decisions, it should promote appropriate, timely diagnostic testing, including specimen collection and pathogen identification, and accurate, timely reporting of results to guide patient treatment. Now, I am talking about diagnostic stewardship because antimicrobial stewardship will have uh, will not be complete unless we talk about diagnostic stewardship. The main objectives of diagnostic stewardships are to deliver patient management, which are guided by timely microbiological data for safer and more effective patient care. Now, this is pertaining to individual patient, but the second objective is more um, is, is something which is more broad, and it tends to deliver accurate and representative antimicrobial resistance surveillance data. So basically, we can see diagnostic stewardship acts in two ways. One thing is in the patient management in an individual case-to-case -case basis, while the second thing is to gather data and to generate data, which will help us to actually advise some empirical treatment for the antimicrobials uh, for all the cases we are seeing in a particular facility. Coming to antimicrobial stewardship, now how it is defined. This refers to coordinated interventions designed to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobial agents by promoting the selection of optimal drug regimen, including dosing, duration of therapy, and route of administration. So as you can note here, the major difference between the antimicrobial stewardship and the diagnostic stewardship is that diagnostic stewardship obviously is more focused on the diagnostics aspects, while the antimicrobial stewardship is more focused on the antimicrobials use itself. So it is more focused on the optimum utilization of antimicrobials and improving the patient outcomes. Uh, by um, uh, going together along with the diagnostic stewardship and other infection control practices we do in hospitals. So what are the aims of an antimicrobial stewardship program? It is optimization of the use of antibiotics, promoting the behavioral change in the antibiotic prescribing and dispensing practices, improvement of quality of care and patient outcomes, saving on unnecessary healthcare costs, reduce the emergence and selection and spread of antimicrobial resistance, prolonging the lifespan of existing antimicrobials we have today, to limit the adverse economic impact of AMR, and finally, 
to build the best practices capacity of a healthcare professional regarding the rational use of antibiotics. So all and all through and through, all aims are focused around antibiotic usage itself. There are five important Ds when we talk about a, about any AMS program or antimicrobial stewardship program. We need to focus on first thing is diagnosis. Then comes the drugs. The dose, the duration, and the de-escalation. So all these five are very important components of any antimicrobial stewardship program, and we'll see how uh, relevant they are in the success of any AMS intervention in a facility. If you want to do that, we can see here the diagnostic stewardship and the antimicrobial stewardship. They are not two different things. They are actually complementing each other. Whenever we see a patient and the patient is evaluated for symptoms, we advise some diagnostic assays if we are suspecting some infective etiology. And thereafter, we start with some antimicrobials. If in case we suspect some bacterial etiology, we will start some empirical antibiotic prescriptions given based on, preferably based on some antibiogram data we have. And lastly, we have to review or modify or stop the antibiotic type uh, or modify the duration based on the information we have gathered over the time from the diagnostic assays or any new information we get about the patient in the subsequent course of the illness. While the diagnostic stewardship includes the ordering part, the specimen collection and processing part, and the reporting part, the antimicrobial stewardship here is focusing on optimizing the empirical use of antibiotics, as well as important part is reviewing the post-prescription antibiotics which we have given. So we have to review. Once this prescribed, we have to review again whether there is a need, there is an indication, do we need to modify anything? Those things are very important component of antimicrobial stewardship. Dr. Hitendu was mentioning about rapid diagnostic tests. Now, this is again a part of diagnostic stewardship, but how important it is when we are talking about antimicrobial stewardship. Now, when we uh, are waiting for the results of microbiological assays, sometimes we uh, prescribe the antimicrobials, waiting for the results, and it may take a long time before we actually realize that the, the, the etiology was not something where the antimicrobial was indicated. Or maybe we have some informed decision taking ability after we receive the results of a diagnostic assay. Based on that, we can modify the drugs or maybe reduce the duration or maybe change the route of uh, administration. All these things can be very well taken up if we have some rapid diagnostic assays available. Some of these diagnostic assays may focus on the diagnostic testing, which are more of microbiological in nature. For example, they can be a substitute or a complementary thing to the conventional culture techniques. And second thing is employing some rapid diagnostic assays which can differentiate between something which can be treated by antimicrobial versus something which doesn't require an antimicrobial. For example, viral illnesses, parasitic infections. There you don't require antibacterial agents. So that is an irrational approach if you are giving some antimicrobials in such cases. This is how your rapid diagnostic test will be differentiating the two and you, will, you can decide whether you are following the right path or not. Similarly, in case of ICU settings, a simple procalcitonin serial assay that will be very, very beneficial because it will help us in understanding whether you are dealing with a bacterial sepsis case or not. If you follow the procalcitonin levels, you can taper down your antimicrobials, you can de escalate and eventually stop your antimicrobials just by following the procalcitonin levels. So, these are some of the measures where rapid diagnostic tests will have a very important role to play. We talked about diagnostic stewardship and we talked about something about the antimicrobial stewardship. A third very important component of any program linked to antimicrobials or to infections is the infection prevention and control activities in a hospital setting or any healthcare facility. Now, while the IPC, that is infection prevention and control practices, focus more on the prevention of spread of bacteria and infections, the antimicrobial stewardship focuses more about more on the antimicrobial uh, selection pressure and optimizing the usage. So, while the two things are a little different, but they are actually again acting in a complementary way. Infection prevention practices will help in reducing the hospital infection rates, reducing the transmission of infections between the, between the patients and the healthcare providers. But at the same time, antimicrobial stewardship help in reducing the usage of antimicrobial. So the two things are actually contributing to each other. If the two things we are seeing, uh, reducing the number of infection rates in a hospital, we reduce the rate at which we are giving the antimicrobials. While reducing the usage of antimicrobials, we reduce the pressure on the bugs and thereafter they are not going to develop the resistance at the same pace if while they are going to develop in the absence of such policies. You can see here there are many activities which are quite common to both the programs, whether we are talking about the stewardship or the infection control. There are many practices including surveillance and data tracking, patient education, uh, maybe you are talk talking about the microbiological diagnostics, outbreak investigations, all these things have something which are common to both. 
So they are not, this is again to highlight that they are not two, very two different things. They are going hand in hand in controlling this uh, problem of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial misuse. So now we are not talking talking only about the AMS approach. So antimicrobial stewardship is something which is only a one component of the AID approach or the integrated approach, which is now more preferable and more adv advocated because it, it actually involves all the three major pillars of uh, uh, and uh, this uh, practices which we are going to target the same thing that is antimicrobials in the bugs. So antimicrobial stewardship, diagnostic stewardship and the infection prevention stewardship. These are three major pillars which are working complementing each other and these three approaches are required to be there together so that uh, we can effectively manage the problem we are discussing today. So what are the core elements of any antimicrobial stewardship program? First thing is hospital leadership commitment. So the leadership in the hospital is very important that they are committed to the goal of this um, antimicrobial misuse or misutilization. There is a account accountability fixed that who is responsible for what activity in an AMS intervention. We also need the expertise of a pharmacist, which, which should be trained in infection control activities. Then action, which includes pre-authorization, audits, feedbacks, which will give an idea of what is going on, how your interventions are working, what is the response or change you have introduced by doing something in this line. Tracking your outcomes, which could be a protocol or uh, process you are monitoring. It's a monitoring of your processes, your monitoring of your outcomes, so that can be done by tracking, reporting, and finally the education of healthcare providers as well as patients. So these are the core uh, elements of any AMS program. For any ideal stewardship team, there has to be uh, some important players. This includes infectious disease clinicians, the pharmacists, clinical microbiologists, infection prevention control committee, and finally, a good information system which connects all. This constitutes an ideal stewardship team for uh, an effective implementation of an AMS program. Whenever we are trying to introduce a start an AMS program any, anywhere new, we should ask ourselves the th three major questions. First thing is, what are you trying to achieve? What is the objective? What is the purpose? What are you trying to do? So you should know what you are trying to achieve. Second thing is, how will you know that change is an improvement? So many changes will happen. How will you, will you know that this change is actually an improvement? So you can do that by measuring something quantitatively. There are various parameters you can measure, which can be followed up, and then they can actually demonstrate that change is actually an improvement. Lastly, you should know what changes can you make that will result in the improvement because not all changes are an improvement. So you have to identify those changes, which are actually true improvements. So these are some of the questions you should ask yourself whenever you are going for that such a such a uh, intervention. There are many interventions which have been described under the AMS. This is a list of basic AMS interventions, which can be applied to many, even the smaller facilities where the basic interventions need to be applied. This is a short list where, which, uh, which can be applied in a short, a small setting as well to, as a, to begin with. But later on, they can be advanced to include more advanced interventions as well. And this is a long list where you can see here, uh, this will include uh, points such as reviewing the antibiotic treatment, review the dose of antibiotics prescribed and so on. So there are different things you can analyze and that can constitute as some of the components of interventions for in this regard. Coming to the antimicrobial prescribing facts, the 30% rule. So before we go ahead, we should understand some, we can just have a look at this data. Uh, it, is, it, is, it has been seen that around 30% of all hospitalized inpatients at any time are given antibiotics. So they are receiving antibiotics at some point of time, around 30% of them. It's a very high number. Over 30% of these are given inappropriately in the community. Up to 30% of all surgical prophylaxis is inappropriate. And 30% of hospital pharmacy costs are due to antimicrobial usage. 10 to 30% of the costs which are associated with antimicrobial use can be saved just by the antimicrobial stewardship program. So you can see this is a small information which actually strikes back that it tells you how uh, wrong we are going, what wrongs we are doing actually in terms of antimicrobial things. So whenever we are going to prescribe an antimicrobial, there is something we should always consider. If we are going to give the antibiotics, first we should think, is there any indication of giving an antibiotic? Are we actually considering a bacterial infection or some infection where this is going to work? Or we are considering some viral infection or it could be a colonization or inflammation? Or do we have, have we ordered any microbiological investigation in case we are thinking about an infective etiology? We should ask ourselves such questions. So clinicians should be very, very careful when they are prescribing antimicrobials uh, because these antimicrobials uh, are a very important tool in our hand to tackle infections. 
in case we are going to lose them and there is no hope left, then we will be something like in a pre-antibiotic era, whether it's a post-antibiotic era, in fact, which is going to happen soon in, in case we are not following up. Second thing is, if we find some indication is there, we will prescribe some antimicrobials. So what points to take care of? What is the probable pathogen we are dealing with? Is it something where this antibiotic class will work or something else will work? Do we need to give empirical treatment? What is the severity of disease? Or are there any comorbidities present or any allergic uh, history of allergy in the patient? Because all these factors are need to, need to be considered when we are prescribing antimicrobials because not anti every antimicrobial will be uh, useful for every patient. It will be, it has to be tailor-made according to the requirements of the patient. Even if we prescribe the antimicrobials empirically, review is very, very important. Because if we are not reviewing, we are missing on a very important component of AMS. We should see whether the indication we thought was is actually right. Is there still an indication of containing the antimicrobials? Are we using the right antibiotics? Because you may have your and microbiology results available by the time, or you may have some more investigations coming up which may guide you whether you are still dealing with the microbiological or uh, infective etiology, which is bacterial or fungal, or you are dealing with something else. So based on that information, you can change your antibiotic. You can switch from IV route to oral route, or maybe you can altogether stop your antimicrobial. So all these will be guided based on the patient progress, as well as the results which become available to you in the due course of time. This is a very important aspect of AMS again. When you are talking about uh, surgical prophylaxis with antimicrobials, Again, think about the indications, whether actually for that surgical procedure, some prophylaxis is required, give only if it is necessary. If you are prescribing, again, right antibiotic for the right time, for the right duration, even shorter durations or longer durations, both will not be helpful. I mean, shorter durations can promote drug resistance, while longer duration itself can have some more adverse effects on the patient itself. So you have to consider all those parameters while de dealing with the stewardship. Finally, you have to stop the antimicrobials. You are giving a prophylaxis and it cannot continue indefinitely. So you should stop within 24 hours of starting because based on the evidence, there is no the evidence is lacking that beyond 24 hours, any prophylaxis is going to help. It's not going to change any patient outcome or increase the risk of infection. So if you are giving some prophylaxis for any surgery, you should not continue beyond 24 hours of starting. Now, there are nine common areas uh, which may be identified for improving the antibiotic prescribing practices. First thing is over prescribing. So many times we will over prescribe. We will give antimicrobials for any fever, whether it's viral, whether it's malaria, whether it's something else, we are not bothered. We will just give antimicrobials, whether it's a pressure of the patient expectation or it is something else, but we are over prescribing. Second thing could be some overly broad spectrum antimicrobials. Commonly, we see that uh, you will give them broad spectrum antimicrobials because you want to just cure the patient rapidly. You want the patient to be happy and those stuff. But that by giving that, you are promoting resistance. So you should try to give your antimicrobials, which are narrow spectrum. And that is, again, a very important part of this. Many times, many of us will see that we are using combination drug therapies, combination of different antimicrobials. Now, some of these antimicrobials may be of different class, having sim similar mechanism of action. They are not going to help. You are only adding to the, the drug burden for the microbes and pushing them towards developing resistance. So again, that is not required. Wrong antibiotic choice, wrong doses, wrong dose intervals, wrong route of administration given for the shorter duration or longer duration, overall the wrong duration given treatment and delayed administration of antimicrobial are some of the other areas, common areas which have been identified, uh, which can be actually addressed if, in any AMS program if you are again in promoting the proper utilization of antimicrobials. These are some of the interventions. If you are trying to improve the antibiotic prescribing policy, these are some of the interventions we can try. It could be linked to education, or it could be something like a feedback to the healthcare providers regarding, regarding the ways they are working or the things they have done better or the things they are not doing good. So that kind of feedback can be given. Some restrictive policies should be there, which can restrict which antibiotics can be prescribed, under what situations you will prescribe the antimicrobials. So such restrictive policies can be framed by the administration or by the individual units. And lastly, structural changes such as in institution of rapid laboratory testing methods, as well as therapeutic drug monitoring. That can again uh, help you to tailor up that how uh, well you are giving your antimicrobials. And so those things can be decided based on the structural changes as well. 
we were talking about anti bag i just mentioned about anti biogram in a uh, briefly but then what actually how does it help you now anti biogram uh, basically helps us in selecting empirical antimicrobial therapy and monitoring the resistance trends over the time so this anti biogram must be stratified by this we mean that this one anti biogram cannot be representative for the entire institute one anti biogram uh, anti biogram has to be ha has to be developed based on the location based on the age group based on the infection site and based on the type of organisms or the mode of acquisition for example whether it's a community acquired organism or a hospital acquired organism so antibiotic resistance patterns are going to vary in different situations so you cannot think that something which is happening in the adult um, wards is will be same as in the icus or in the pediatric units so every area is different and every area will have its own profile of bugs its own profile of antimicrobial resistance so this has to be stratified this is again a very important part to know another important part i would like to highlight is the prescription review so many times we will give antimicrobials but there should be some policies and um, restrictions on that as well for example if you are going to start some certain antimicrobials which are considered to be reserved those antimicrobials should not be given unless they it has been taken uh, some inputs have been taken from the stewardship so, so the clinicians should have some connection with the stewardship team so that they can be guided about the right approach towards antimicrobial administration so that reserved drugs and special drugs may be kept for the future the other thing is post prescription review even if it has the antimicrobials have been started periodic review of the same should be done it should be a daily review of the prescriptions by the stewardship team this will this again is a very important component and a strong recommendation again which has shown very good results in terms of improving the overall patient outcome and in reducing the misutilization of the antimicrobial so this is a very important aspect of uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs this is a sample ams review form where you can see there are uh, some factors we can highlight including the day of administration of antimicrobial the review date when it was reviewed uh, when you plan to stop and all those things so these are some of the areas you can mention on your ams review form that, that is very handy and can be followed up by the team on a daily basis whenever they visit the patients lastly if you are talking about the tracking of outcomes this is again a very important component of uh, stewardship programs because you have done something you have tried to introduce a change you want something to happen but how will you know that is happening so you will track outcomes so the tracking outcomes can have two components you can either measure your processes whether the processes you introduced are being followed up or not for example you may try to say see that Uh, the duration of therapy which was defined is it being followed and to what extent similarly what is the proportion of patients with revision of antibiotics based on microbiological data so these are some of the processes or guidelines you gave but how many of them are being adhered to those processes can be monitored these are some examples similarly you can uh, measure your outcomes whether the expected outcome has happened or not and to what extent again for example you can monitor the hospital length of stay 30 day mortality unplanned hospital readmission within 30 days of discharge or maybe proportion of patients with clinical failure or development of c difficult infections in patients who were treated in a hospital setting so all these are some of the parameters you can record you can track and this will actually act as a quality indicator for yourself how well you are performing in your interventions and your in your program so lastly i will just talk about one more thing that ams principles um also apply to all the agricultural sectors or animal sectors not only a human problem everything which is non human problem is also a human problem now because we are talking about one health one health includes everything so if we are not caring about the antimicrobial usage in the animal or agricultural sectors that is ultimately going to indirectly affect our health because the resistance will be developing there and the resistant bugs will reach us sometime so that is again an important area to address the other thing is there are many other agents besides bacteria including viruses fungi parasites there again the antimicrobial resistance is there but they are not creating that much panic the more focus still is on the bacterial antimicrobial resistance so these are again some areas which need some focus and they should also be addressed in any, in most ams programs which are being followed in future thank you very much thank you
um, very good morning to all of you. And I'm Dr. Gagandeep Singh. I'm uh, additional professor in the Department of Microbiology, and I work in the area of fungal infections. And uh, I'll delve into the details of antifungal resistance and antifungal stewardship in the next 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, I think uh, uh, Sanjay again in the limelight uh, as WHO very recently uh, released its fungal priority pathogen list. It was on the 25th of October 2022 that the list was uh, released. And uh, WHO before releasing this list, uh, you know, kept a lot of things in mind uh, while choosing the fungal priority pathogen list. And the first and the foremost was uh, infections, fungal infections, which are of public health importance. And these were uh, a strong determinant of priority. Second was antifungal resistance as again uh, one of the top priorities while choosing these pathogens. Third was the systematic reviews which had revealed major knowledge gaps on global burden of fungal infections and antifungal resistance. And therefore WHO wanted that if it highlights uh, different fungi which need uh, filling up of these gaps it would help. And finally the fungal pathogen distribution and epidemiology varying uh, they accord, uh, according to the different regions and this also needs to be addressed because again distribution of fungal infections is not uh, uh, you know the knowledge of the distribution is not very clear so that also needs to be addressed and this is uh, the fungal the WHO's fungal priority pathogen list and as you can see it has been divided into three groups the critical group the high group and the medium group and the critical group includes the Cryptococcus neoformans, Candida auris, Aspergillus fumigatus and Candida albicans. And the higher uh, group includes uh, Nachisiomyces glabrata, which is earlier known as Candida glabrata, Histoplasma, Eumycetoma uh, causing agents, Mucarales, Fusarium, Candida tropicalis, Candida parapsilosis and the medium group I won't go into the details. And uh, today I'll be discussing more about, you know, two uh, or three important pathogens. One is Candida auris, Candida, uh, the Aspergillus fumigatus and the drug, drug resistant dermatophytosis. But before that, I'll just give you an overview of uh, how antifungal agents work and how uh, resistance develops over a period of time. So we uh, know that, the, you know, the armamentarium available uh, against fungi is very limited. We hardly have uh, three important groups and a few other antifungal agents. So, azoles, they act by inhibiting the agosterol uh, synthesis, which is a component of the fungal cell membrane. Polyenes, again, they bind to agosterol and produce pores, disrupt the fungal cell membrane and thereby the fungi ultimately are killed. And echinocandins, these are uh, relatively, uh, you know, recent uh, development in the area of antifungals and these inhibit glucan synthase enzyme, which uh, thereby inhibits the cell wall synthesis and again disruption of the fungal cell wall leads to death of the fungi. If you look at overall activity and this is important to understand because not every antifungal would you know uh, be active against all the fungi so it's not you know one answer against all fungal infections. So if you look at uh, the most commonly used ones are like amphotericin B. Amphotericin B although uh, is uh, known to be a broad spectrum antifungal but still it has some uh, you know, limitations. So, it's active mostly against majority of the Candida, Cryptococcus, the dimorphic fungi, Aspergillus. However, the utility against, um, you know, the Schedosporium, Fusarium and a few of the Aspergillus species like Aspergillus cereus are limited. If we talk about the azoles, uh, so fluconazole, uh, if you want to just broadly remember its activities primarily against uh, Candida species and cryptococcus and it's not very useful against molds. If you talk about the triazoles like itraconazole, voriconazole and posoconazole, they have broader spectrum vis-a-vis -vis fluconazole. However, these again have some limitations as they don't act very well against the mucarales, uh, especially the itraconazole and the voriconazole and against the schedosporium and fusarium. Uh, newer uh, triazoles like posoconazole and isaviconazole have very wide spectrum and almost all the um, fungi, you know, they, they are active against. If I talk about the echinocandins, currently three um, groups are available like the anidula fungin, the caspofungin and the mycofungin and primarily their utility is against 
uh, yeast infections and also they are uh, they show good activity against aspergillus if you talk about molds but not um, the other molds then uh, the problem of antifungal resistance can be uh, you know discussed under three subheadings one is intrinsic resistance the other is acquired resistance and the third one is clinical resistance so what i mean by intrinsic resistance is that due to you know the genetic makeup of the fungus it is intrinsically resistant to the antifungal being used and this is a list of commonly encountered fungi which are intrinsically resistant to the corresponding uh, antifungal like candida cruza you know is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole glabrata has shows higher mics to fluconazole uh, similarly candida parapsilosis shows higher mics to kinocandins if you talk about molds pseudalastira boidi which was uh, you know which is now known as uh, skidosporium is uh, it doesn't show it, you know amphotericin b doesn't have uh, much activity against this a, a same is for fusarium and pseudomyces and also aspergillus terius uh, you can it cannot be treated with amphotericin b acquired resistance is usually seen when you know uh, there are uh, prolonged exposure to antifungals or antifungals are being used uh, in the environment especially agriculture and this if you look at the mechanisms there are many mechanisms uh, which can lead to acquired drug resistance in uh, antifungals but majority of these are uh, you know mutations in gene encoding the target proteins uh, efflux pumps, uh, you know, upregulation of efflux pumps is a very important factor as far as uh, antifungal resistance is concerned, and also uh, inhibitors uh, for the uh, target ratio. If I uh, talk about the timeline, you can see uh, on the left we have the various introduction of various uh, antifungal agents, and corresponding to those are, uh, you know when the drug resistance to these were reported. So, amphotericin B was, uh, uh, you know, introduced way back in the 50s, uh, followed by flu cytosine, but we started reporting drug resistance somewhere, uh, you know, almost uh, immediately. And uh, we can see uh, ketoconazole, uh, you know, treatment failures were seen in the earlier 80s, flu uh, fluconazole in the 90s, and now almost all the drugs that are available show some a level of drug resistance which is again important to understand but one thing uh, you know sort of uh, people who look into fungal infections one thing good about uh, you know acquired drug resistance against fungi is that it's not as fast track as it is in bacteria so the drug resistance the development the timeline is not as fast that you start giving antibiotics and development uh, is immediately seen as we, it is seen in bacteria because we, there aren't any enzymes like beta lactamases which are acting against the antibiotics there is no horizontal i won't say no the, although there are certain reports of horizontal gene transfer but it's a rare event in, in uh, fungal infections and also we don't see trans uh, you know transfer of genetic uh, um, elements uh, through plasmids or transposons and thereby uh, Broadly, this affects that the, the, the speed by which antifungal resistance is developing is pretty slow vis-a-vis -vis the bacteria. Today, I'll be just be, uh, you know, discussing about three important uh, drug-resistant fungi. One are the multi-drug resistant Candida auris, the azole resistant Aspergillus fumigatus, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the third is again a pandemic which is going on, are the tabenafine resistant dermatophytes. Candida auris, uh, uh, all of you know, is a yeast that can produce invasive candidiasis with very high mortality because it is multidrug resistant. And it has, again, in addition to being multidrug resistant, it has very high outbreak potential. And uh, it has already produced several hospital outbreaks, including ours. And there are so many hospitals within India which are reporting outbreaks due to Candida auris. And one of the very important uh, Factors uh, contributing to outbreak potential is its ability to survive on inanimate surfaces in the hospital. And um, it, again, another issue with the Candida auris is that there is, it has difficulty, uh, you know, in identifying Candida auris. You need sophisticated tools. Conventional uh, methods usually fail to identify Candida auris. You at least need uh, a Vitec uh, 2 system or Malditoff or sequencing to identify candida auris. So, until unless you identify, uh, you know, you won't be able to take appropriate measures to curb its spread within a hospital environment. 
and uh, preventive measures are not well established although in india icmr had come out with a whole protocol of how we can uh, you know um, decrease colonization in, in parents and also uh, take care of the you know contamination in the hospital environment still we see that uh, candida auris is very very smart and it it's a perfect a pathogen causing for causing uh, healthcare associated infections if i talk about the overall the resistance fluconazole resistance is uh, you know it varies from 85% to 100% uh, and most of our isolates are all, they almost or always fluconazole resistant voriconazole is somewhere around 50% amphotericin b again there's a range of 8 to 35% and the kinocandins uh, is the upper limit is around 8% and kinocandins currently are the drug of choice for treating candida auris um, infections but you know uh, one thing uh, very important and you know uh, once we realize that kinocandins are the drug of choice there is somehow uh, a tendency to use kinocandins in even against prophylaxis but we need to understand that kinocandin prophylaxis is in ineffective as it does not penetrate adequately on the skin where actually the candida auris survives in the patient and so breakthrough MDR candida auris are promoted by this practice of giving or treating patients empirically or prophylactically by giving a kind of guidance. Next, I'll be talking about aspergillus fumigators. Although currently it's not, uh, you know, drug resistant aspergillus fumigators is not a problem uh, as far as India is concerned, but we need to be uh, very, very careful and alert. So can uh, aspergillus fumigators we know is a common agent causing um, invasive chronic and allergic aspergillosis worldwide and collectively it affects uh, approximately 10 million people across the world and uh, if we talk about the drugs effective against aspergillus uh, you know there are uh, few oral drugs available from the triazole group like the itraconazole and the voriconazole which are also part of the WHO essential medicine list and also posaconazole and isaviconazole and I'm talking about the triazoles because these are the ones where we are seeing a lot of drug resistance. So broadly, there are two circumstances, as I had already mentioned earlier as well, that uh, firstly, you know, the circumstances which are leading to drug resistance in aspergillus fumigators. Firstly, it is uh, in the environment strains, uh, they are getting uh, highly resistant to azoles because of widespread use of azole fungicides in agriculture. So, so we want to protect our, uh, you know, uh, uh, crops against fungal uh, diseases but inadvertently those fungicides are also very closely related uh, to the triazoles that we are using and these develop uh, fun uh, drug resistance. And the second is when we are using azoles as long term therapy, this like in patients of uh, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, these patients are on long term itraconazole or even sometimes voriconazole. So these can uh, you know, uh, pressurize the fungus to, you know, undergo mutations and increase uh, drug resistance. Although the rates are higher, much higher in Europe, up to 20%, China has been reporting uh, up to 80% drug resistance in, you know, because of a lot of use of azoles in greenhouses. Vietnam has reported up to, you know, 50% uh, of its environmental strains to be multi-drug resistant and almost 85% uh, resistant to itraconazole and this practice you know this is, this is a very new upcoming uh, evidence that uh, this is because of a lot of uh, azole use in aquaculture not only in agriculture even in aquaculture we're using a lot of uh, azoles which is leading to environmental uh, drug resistance to aspergillus uh, or to azoles uh, in as aspergillus species indian studies uh, you know in the environment at least they have shown a wide variation. Delhi mostly uh, published literature shows that it's just around 5%, but studies from Uttar Pradesh uh, have shown, uh, you know, the percentage to be up to 25%. Although clinical isolate rates uh, are very, very low, maybe less than 1%. So we need not worry as of now, but we need to be uh, cautious uh, in the future. This is one thing I think all of us are aware about. This is an ongoing pandemic it's a dermatologist's nightmare. So resistance in dermatophytes is again a major problem currently and the failure rates can be as high as 30% to tabinafine. And we are seeing large uh, areas of involvement, very rapid progression and no response to the currently used first line uh, treatment. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention here about is that even although the trichophyton mentagrophyte is what was earlier known to cause this 
sort of an outbreak. But now, over a period of time, genetic studies have shown that it is slightly distinct from the routine mantagraphite that we encounter in laboratories. And now, it has been rechristened as uh, trichophyton uh, indotini. This is the latest name. And from 2020 onwards, uh, this species uh, name is, will, uh, is being used even in uh, publications that have been published uh, from India and across the world. If you look at uh, the drug resistance, uh, very high uh, degree of drug resistance is shown to tabenafine, but in addition to griseofulvil and fluconazole also. And uh, this is basically because of, uh, you know, over-the-counter availability of combination drugs like steroids, antibiotics and antifungals are very easily available over-the-counter. And patients, uh, as Dr. Hitinder had also mentioned, that nobody completes the course. So they feel, because of steroids being combined with antibiotics and antifungals, patients start feeling, uh, you know, the symptoms are much better very quickly. So it's always an incomplete course. So thereby that exposure to antifungals leads to uh, mutations in the squalene epoxidase gene, which is uh, uh, responsible for the tabenafine resistance. And most of the time we see any MIC above one microgram uh, per uh, ml show is, it you know, correlates well with the uh, squalene epoxidase mutations. Coming to antifungal stewardship, uh, Dr. Nishant has given a very nice overview of uh, what antimicrobial uh, stewardship program uh, is all about. But I will be covering antifungal stewardship because generally, you know, the focus is more on the antibiotic uh, stewardship, but antifungal somehow, you know, uh, it uh, gets lost in the way. So, this has already been discussed. Why antifungal stewardship? Because uh, as I said, antimicrobial stewardship has uh, is overwhelmingly focused on antibiotics. But one thing that one needs to remember about antifungal stewardship is that, uh, like in anti uh, you know antibiotic stewardship, we are focusing more on preventing emergence of drug resistance. That is actually not the aim of a uh, antifungal stewardship. Ultimate aim is that only. But uh, one of the major focus is on preventing toxicities and also reducing the drug cost of uh, treating of uh, you know a fungal infection so that that is one thing which we need to remember uh, a lot of activities are in parallel to the antibiotic stewardship like you know guidelines uh, for antifungal usage in the institution then recommendations for empiric therapy which need to be uh, made de-escalation of empiric therapies dosing and dose adjustments these are all similar to what we do in even in the antibiotic stewardship the primary objective of an antifungal stewardship is to optimize better outcomes for patients with invasive fungal infections while minimizing any unintended consequences of antifungal use including toxicity, selection of resistant fungi and emergence of uh, antifungal resistance. So what are the activities that actually uh, are included under the antifungal stewardship uh, program? Uh, you know, first and the foremost is that anybody involved in antifungal stewardship should have very comprehensive knowledge of uh, the various treatment guidelines available uh, across the world, across the globe. And uh, a primary focus should be on best quality of care, not cost saving. When I mean, you know, when I said we need to decrease the cost, I didn't mean that we need, uh, we start using a, uh, you know, poor efficacy drug just because it's cheaper. Basically, it is that we should stop unnecessary therapy whenever it is not uh, you know required and also clinical experience to know when to infer likely results if not yet available or samples cannot be or were not sent uh, another you know uh, important um, uh, um, points under the antifungal stewardship are for a successful program is that rapid diagnostic services should always be available notably mycology results but also Imaging, because imaging has a lot of role to do. We know, uh, barring, you know, the lateral flows or the direct microscopy, fungi usually take a lot of time for, uh, you know, culture results. So, in, in addition to mycology results, imaging does help. So, uh, too often, turnaround time for the results takes days. So, empiric therapies are started, which are often wrong choices. So, your clinicians should have appropriate knowledge of when to start what. Antifungal Therapeutic drug monitoring, especially for voriconazole, itraconazole, posaconazole, or even sometimes for flu cytosine, uh, should be done in routine because we know 
that uh, very often this contributes to clinical failure as i had already mentioned this this uh, this is due to the this contributes to the clinical failure so we should know that in spite of giving patient the right dose if the right serum levels are not being achieved there is probably some uh, issues with the pkpd of the drug which need to be addressed rather than just labeling it as uh, fungal resistance and also uh, as far as fungi are concerned immediate access to drug interaction data again is very very important because a lot of these especially the triazoles show a lot of drug drug interactions which again lead to clinical failure which we need to bear in mind so just to summarize uh, so emergence of multi drug resistant candida auris is a great challenge uh, both as far as the um, uh, hospital infection control practices are concerned and even the patient management aspergillus fumigatus is showing triazole resistance um especially in patients across europe but it may be a challenge to us in india tomorrow uh, and there are reports of intrinsic resistant candida and aspergillus species uh, increasing uh, as pathogens tabenafine resistance in dermatophytes is a major concern in asia and uh, now you know because of uh, ease of travel uh, almost uh, all uh, continents across the world are reporting this and we cannot be complacent just because the rates of drug resistance you know development of drug resistance are slower in fungi so we need not be complacent and the amount of resistance uh, whatever is there has complicated antifungal management already so institutions should develop separate antifungal stewardship program under the umbrella of the antimicrobial stewardship program it should go hand in hand but there should be a special focus on this because the ultimate the targets are little different from what uh, the antibiotic stewardship programs tend to achieve thank you so much good morning uh, so i'll be speaking on tuberculosis and drug resistance in tuberculosis and i will um, take the cues from what uh, dr hitendra dr nishant and dr gagandeep have put in together and of course dean madam uh, how she introduced the topic so my job is going to be a little tricky because i'm going to touch upon the disease how the resistance comes about and what can we do about it So tuberculosis, uh, as we are all aware, is an infectious disease caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which generally affects the lungs, but will also go on to involve the extra pulmonary uh, tissues. The risk factors, which are clearly known and defined, are malnutrition, diabetes, HIV, infection, poor immunity due to some other, um, uh, you know, immune, um, you know, compromising uh, states, severe renal disease, lung diseases like silicosis, asbestosis, and so on. people who do substance abuse are uh, predisposed to tb as well overcrowding as we all know in slums i have a picture to the right which is a, a bitter truth of our times and um, so poor economic conditions inadequate ventilation as uh, um is uh, part of the you know small um, um housing uh, and poor uh, you know housing conditions in urban areas but uh, the tb disease is not limited to urban areas the villagers who go back from the urban areas take the disease back to their hometowns and uh, villages it is an occupational risk like i said um, uh, you know silicosis and uh, uh, occupations which involve scarring of the lungs could actually enhance the disease now the picture at the bottom clearly uh, narrates the whole story one patient with infectious pulmonary tb if untreated could actually infect 10 to 15 persons in a year and this is just one study that says it the numbers could be much higher than this we like to keep it conservative and stick to 10 to 15 persons a year but if you can imagine a person who has multi drug resistant tb spreading to 15 persons a year and what the load would be for the globe for the country for uh, the individual per se if he gets a disease which is difficult to diagnose difficult to treat and i'll shortly come to why it is difficult to treat Now this was a report published this year uh, <clears throat> on the TB day of the TB prevalence survey carried out by ICMR um, over the years 2019 and 21 so just to uh, make you aware of the burden of TB in our country so what we found was the prevalence of microbiologically confirmed pulmonary TB among uh, 15 years and older population younger children were not included 
was to the tune of 316 uh, persons per lakh population. So that is the kind of pulmonary TB. In addition, we have the extra pulmonary TB, which was not really um, uh, looked at in this particular uh, prevalence survey. The highest pulmonary TB prevalence of 534 per lakh was in Delhi, where we live. And we must realize the amount of disease being spreading in the, in the city around us. And we must make our, like uh, Dr. Gandeep said, must play our part in reducing that disease spread and, of course, reducing the drug resistance burden, which I'll come to shortly. Lowest prevalence was shown in Kerala, 115 per lakh. Even that is a big number. Higher prevalence was shown in older age group in males. Uh, possibly they came out, you know, they were detected more easily. But this is what the prevalence survey found. The malnourished, the smokers, alcoholics and known diabetics. A considerable amount of prevalent TB cases were contributed by patients with past history of TB. So what, does, what is the message this gives us? What has been said since the morning? The patients take the treatment. First, they initiate treatment without, uh, you know, uh, taking the due prescription from a treating physician. If they start treatment, they possibly try it till they feel better and drop the treatment. And they often do not complete the treatment, considering that, you know, if they're feeling better, they would have been cured of the disease. Those are the issues which lead to relapses. And like we found in the prevalence survey, the past history of TB, patients possibly had a relapse. Or they could have had uh, reinfection in, in patients who had comorbidities or other, uh, you know, high-risk uh, situations. The, the last very significant point I want to bring here is 63% of the chest symptomatics did not seek health care and majority had ignored the symptoms, did not recognize it as an illness, especially because TB is uh, an insidious onset disease, it will present with, uh, you know, symptoms like low-grade fever, which a patient can ignore as uh, not a, uh, really due to an illness, cough and cold, which can again be ignored. So these are the points where, um, you know, uh, Everybody who's listening to the lecture today, be it, um, you know, the healthcare workers, even the, the paramedical staff, the nurses, could uh, spread this knowledge around and send these patients to the program, to the uh, care uh, givers. This is a survey on drug resistance survey, which was concluded uh, in the year 2016, published in 17, um, uh, after the survey was concluded. And what are the findings of this survey? This shows... This was again a countrywide uh, drug resistance survey uh, um, uh, carried out with WHO support. Now, what they found was MDR-TB, which is defined as resistance to the two most important drugs used for treating um, rifampicin sensitive TB. So, what are the drugs we use? We use rifampicin and INH. So, resistance to rifampicin and INH together is called MDR-TB, which was found to be 6% in the country. And amongst those which who had no previous history of TB, that is primary TB, it was uh, to the tune of 2.8%, while 11.6% amongst those who were previously treated. So, considering the large number uh, of uh, patients that we just alluded to in the previous slide, you can imagine if this is the percentage of MDR, we are dealing with a big, you know, iceberg of MDR and possibly are only looking at the tip of the iceberg. Among the MDR-TB patients, the drugs that we use for treating are, of course, the, the I will come to that as well shortly. Resistance to fluoroquinolones was observed in about 22% patients and 4% uh, to the second-line injectable drugs, which were being used at the time the survey was carried out. Now, the WHO and the National TB Elimination Program is trying to remove the injectable drugs because the oral drugs uh, combination uh, can actually replace these drugs. Also, additional resistance to at least one drug in MDR patients, either fluoroquinolone or second-end injectables, uh, was so the XDR-TB was uh, to the tune of 1.3%. Now, I would like to move on, but, uh, you know, what is of importance is INH resistance in our country is, again, very high. And there has been evidence that generated which shows that possibly the use of INH as TB preventive treatment could have led to INH resistance as well. Pyrazinamide resistance is another um, uh, point to be noted here. 7% amongst, uh, you know, higher again uh, amongst the previously treated patients and lower in the uh, newly. Now, I want to bring in here the Global TB Report um, of 2022 published this year. 
which shows the the first eight countries and the the number of patients um you know the estimates of tb patients from these countries and in all these eight countries account for two thirds of the global cases and india here as you can see contributes the maximum we look at the mdr burden again the seven countries with the highest burden in terms of numbers of mdr and rifampicin resistant tb that accounts for two thirds of the global uh, mdr rr tb in 21 india again has contributed more than a lakh patients and you can imagine how much burden that adds to our country's uh, system for taking care of these patients and how much risk these patients carry for they may not improve or uh, you know even for risk of mortality now so the national tb program has to work very hard to diagnose and treat mdr and this is a flow chart so we have all kinds of tests available to us we use line probe assay we use liquid culture dst and before we start treatment for these mdr patients we know that the patient has to be sensitive to bedaquiline which is one of the newer drugs pyrazinamide clofazamine moxifloxacin the quinolone which i said had very high resistance in our country linazolid and dilamonid now after you see after ensuring that the patient does not have resistance to inh we look at we look at both catchichin and inh gene to know which of the drugs can be used fluoroquinolone resistance again we have to rule out like i mentioned earlier we decide whether the patient goes on shorter oral regimen or the patient goes on the longer oral regimen additional resistance or intolerance or non availability of any drug in the use er, prescribed by the uh, treating doctor can be one of the exclusion criteria now another so the idea of bringing in these um, flow charts was to share with you how much intense this workup can be and after actually deciding what regimen is to be given to the patients whether we give giving shorter oral regimen or the longer oral or even a modified regimen depending on the absence of the you know effective drugs for example we we may use um, in inh resistance alone we will have to have individualized treatment so this in itself is a marathon exercise and after that if the patients do not stick to the treatment prescribed what happens so i will give you uh, uh, in uh, you know shortly a glimpse of what happens to patients who are not actually sticking to the treatment regimen before that this is the treatment success rate of mdr and xdrtb patients that we've observed over the years so this graph tells us between 2012 and 2017 the the outcome of uh, MDR treatment was not very great we were you know successful only in uh, you know in 34% to 49% patients it's only in 2018 when bedaquiline came on the uh, you know was made available um under the the cap uh, scheme that the the uh, responses started becoming better but of course they these can still be improved if we follow a due um Uh, you know uh, if i can use the word stewardship here though for tb we do not use the word stewardship here but if we if we can actually ensure patient compliance treatment prescribed properly now coming straight away to the who global report 2022 of madam alluded to the sdgs so these were the 2025 milestones the tb incidence rate uh, the milestone was 50% what we achieved by 21 was only 10% the other milestone was reduction in the tb deaths we were expected to reduce 75% but we had only 6% reduction and we uh, the target was to um, you know patients who were facing catastrophic uh, costs the target for 25 2025 was zero until 21 we've only achieved 48% now again coming back to a map of the globe to bring to you the 10 countries which actually got affected during the covid pandemic so much so there was a large gap between notifications of new and relapse incident tb cases and the best estimates of tb incidents in the year 2021 again we are the leaders here it's wonder wonderful to be a leader and a global leader but not in this case i mean this is a serious uh, uh, concern that we all must wake up to today tomorrow will be late now these are the countries which were able to actually improve upon the impact of covid so during covid as you're all aware the lockdowns um uh, did not allow the patients to reach the facility the doctors could not reach the patients the treatments were not available diagnosis was much delayed drug resistance detection was delayed 
So the WHO report, you know, groups these countries. So that the negative impact in 2020, partial recovery in 21, and India falls in here. There are several countries who had negative impact in, uh, you know, 2020 and recovered um, to be uh, to to better than 2019 levels in 21, as you can see in the graph B. There are a few countries which have had worse scenarios, but let me move on. Just this was just to allude upon, you know. Um, calamities as they may worsen the TB control. So we might as well keep TB control within our uh, hands. Now this is again from the WHO TB report which talks of the dip as you can notice in 2020 in the number of notified cases and uh, the patients who were put on MDR-TB treatment where it was again there was a major dip during the COVID pandemic. Now the MDR-TB in addition so we need to look at the extrinsic and environmental factors which can be, um, you know, diagnostic delays due to either no access or delay in communicating a test result to the patient or the doctor. And of course, like Dr. Hitendra mentioned right in the beginning, we have to have the optimally sensitive, optimally specific diagnostic methods, which luckily in the case of tuberculosis, we do have. And we are also working on uh, Indian indigenous tests and uh, uh, making them available, uh, you know, countrywide by the program. The, the National TB Elimination Program is doing an excellent job, but we need the collaboration of all the healthcare workers to uh, support the patients and bring them to the program. Treatment, if the treatment is inadequate. Now, this is where the patient's contribution actually comes in. He, the patient needs to comply to the treatment. So, if he takes, so one is, of course, if the prescribing person gives inadequate, inadequate treatment regimens or there's an interrupted drug supply, as did happen during the COVID times, Poor drug quality that we have ensured. So there have been studies which have ensured the drug quality available under the TB program. This has been studies done by pharmacologists at PGI Chandigarh and the network throughout the country. So drug quality is uh, good quality. Drug-drug interactions are very important, especially we are aware of drug-drug interactions in patients with HIV when they take anti-TB treatment. We have to ensure that such uh, uh, interactions do not actually, uh, you know, uh, inhibit each other's actions. Administration of transient hypermutation inducing drugs. So I will allude to this in the uh, next few slides. The patient uh, has to take care of high risk living environment, behavioral factors like non compliance. So, as has been alluded to since morning, whatever drugs are prescribed, he needs to take that religiously. Treatment seeking behavior. The, the patient himself has to be willing to take treatment for his own uh, well being. Uh, patient-dependent pharmacokinetic and dynamic properties. So, they, like I mentioned, there could be interactions or there could be, you know, um, chronic illnesses like chronic renal disease or uh, chronic liver disease where the drug uh, PKPD could change, which, of course, the treating physician, when he's prescribing, will take care of. So, the patient has to diligently follow the treating physician and if he actually, you know, has an issue, he should go back to the doctor. The comorbidities, as I already mentioned, Immunological factors, if they could delay the patient's response. Looking at the genetics and the intrinsic and bacterial factors, we have issues like persistence. Now, factors which lead to persistence have not been very uh, wonderfully understood. There can be phenotypic variability of bacteria, and we have generated a lot of data on genotypic variability throughout the country, and there's ample data throughout the world how these uh, different genotypes differ, uh, you know, are differ, uh, differ from each other in their... Um, uh, transmission and their capability to involve, uh, uh, you know, a healthy, uh, so some of the genotypes will cause disease in older patients and so on. Uh, dormancy, as we are all aware, few bacteria, uh, this is one of the uh, few where the latency has been well known for a long time and the organism can actually go dormant. This is one of the major reasons persistence and dormancy that the treatment has to be completed. So, of the mechanisms of uh, drug resistance in TB, um, most common is mutations and increased efflux pump activation due to mutations. Again, genetics, I've already alluded to, different genotypes uh, have, uh, you know, even resistance patterns may differ. The number of bacteria in a patient could also affect um, uh, the uh, resistance in a, in a, for example, in a cavity, in a, in a lung cavity. Heteroresistance is something which is due to a polyclonal a polyclonal uh, disease, which is more than one genotypes being present in a in a cavity of uh, pulmonary TB. And heteroresistance is important because the moment we start treatment, if the patient is detected as sensitive, 
due to the limit of detection of a test which does not pick heteroresistance, there can be accumulation of resistance while the patient is on treatment. So you may think the patient is compliant, treatment is being given, the drugs are good. Why does the patient accumulate resistance during the treatment? So the reason could be heteroresistance. Hence, we must diagnose it well in time and be ready to. Uh, so this is why we always recommend that the patient follows up uh, during the treatment. So after first month, after the end of intensive phase, after the completion of the uh, continuing phase and two years after the uh, treatment is completed is the duration where the patient could actually have a relapse. Relapse can happen later as well, but within two years, the relapse can be more. So here is the summary table which talks about the mutation. So TB, just like fungi, does not transfer horizontal, uh, you know, there is very few reports of horizontal gene transfer. Primarily drug resistance is due to mutations and this is a, a long list. And what is very important in uh, TB, it's a very smart pathogen. So first it will get a mutation and if the mutation affects its fitness, in case the fitness of the organism is affected, which is a known phenomenon due to the, the occurrence of a new mutation, it comes up with a compensatory mutation. So this picture, we can clearly see the CAT G mutation may have other CAT G mutations, which is actually balancing a mutation which may be responsible for the bacterium to die. So basically, it is ensuring its own survival. The RPOB 531 mutation may have a compensatory muta mutation in other sites of RPOA or RPOC gene. Similarly, in the other genes. So the compensatory mutation is a phenomenon which is best described in the case of tuberculosis. And here um, is a positive. So this phenomenon of compensatory mutations is called epistasis. And a a beautifully described positive epistasis occurs between RPOB mutation and the gyre mutation, meaning thereby resistance to fluoroquinolones and to rifampicin could actually make the bacterium better transmissible. So it enhances the transmission capability of the organism. Hence, we should never prescribe these two drugs together. This is why I'm repeatedly saying sticking to the prescription of the doctor is the most important uh, uh, part the patient could actually play in his own treatment. Uh, so epistasis does get affected. Uh, compensatory mutation, like I said, is part of the epistasis. It does get affected by the strain genetic background, meaning that by the different genotypes have different capability to have compensatory mutations. And the, the, the mutations which we mentioned above in the previous uh, that table that we talked about, each mutation leads to a certain level of MIC. Hence, we can decide the drug dose we, we can give. Now, this uh, excerpt I brought to share with you, this is a study from, the, uh, from Georgia where they showed that prisons in Georgia is where transmissions happen and transmis the, the strains which are the MDRTB strains which are transmitting are actually carrying a lot of compensatory mutations. And what eventually happens is there is so much transmission of MDRTB happening in prisons and, uh, you know, this, these transmitting uh, in the mycobacterium tuberculosis are full of compensatory mutations, meaning thereby they are very stable and, uh, you know, they are easy to transmit. And the burden of MDRTB in the, in the uh, you know, outside the prison is also contributed by the transmitting agent in the prisons. Now, what... In TB, like I said, um, no plasmids are defined. As I mentioned, the, the horizontal gene transfer is very minimally reported, in fact, negligible. So what leads to this mutation? So mutations are primarily a naturally occurring phenomenon, and it is a selection of these naturally occurring mutations which leads to drug resistance in the case of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, very few examples since I uh, have to stick to time. Mutation rates may be raised during exposure to sub-inhibitory concentrations of certain antibiotics. Examples here are fluoroquinolones, which cause, uh, you know, um, which could lead to genome. So, genome-wide expression studies have shown upregulation of DNA repair clusters in response to fluoroquinolones. Previous use of quinolones is also associated with development of res uh, resistance to first-line anti-TB drugs. So, not only the resistance to quinolones per se, but also to the first-line anti-TB drugs. Exposure to INH, a drug that does not directly act on DNA metabolic processes, might also result in higher mutation rates. Efflux pumps do also get induced. They enable the organism to throw out the drug from inside the bacterium. 
and um, this these get induced during exposure which cause low level resistance and uh, uh, though we can use efflux pump inhibitors but then the efflux so efflux pump mutations are only the first step in acquiring high MIC mutations. Now this is a picture to just uh, share with you that this particular patient had initial resistance to drugs 1 to 7 when the patient got infected but while on treatment he uh, you know he uh, acquired resistance to the drug 8 which was added further to the drug 9 and this uh, uh, the, the pathogen was so competent in transmitting that this could go on transmitting further. So unless we take care of the tenets, the basic tenets of, um, uh, you know, care uh, of treatment of sensitive as well as MDRTB, we may land up in a situation like this. Here I have brought in an article which talks of a study where um, patients on bedaculin treatment acquired resistance while on treatment. So this was acquired bedaculin resistance and the, the percentage could be very high. Uh, it's just that we may be starting to see this now and uh, because this is a new drug added, like I said, only in the past two years it has been made available to MDRTB um, uh, treatment regimen. Another study where they showed microevolution of m tuberculosis within a patient actually led to high MIC causing mutation in the ATPE gene. This is a study which was published uh, in three, so this is one patient which was uh, Three different publications came out for this patient who got cured after the first uh, treatment regimen was uh, symptom free for six months but he had accumulated resistance to bedaquiline during his uh, six uh, his nine month uh, treatment regimen he relapsed after six months and then at that point in time he had a resistance to practically everything available so he had to undergo same patient published in another journal at that time he had to undergo resection of the lung to uh, get cured by God's grace he got saved but we could actually land up in such a situation because TB is a smart bacillus so here I bring in a slide uh, from the TB program to share with you the that the uh, MDR TB regimen was was not very successful till such time that we had the new bedaquiline drug made available to the MDR and XDR TB patient and um, uh, uh, we just need to watch out since we do not have a lot of new drugs coming in we need to take care of what we have the key challenges in controlling tb like i alluded to right in the first slide under reporting and uncertain care of tb patients um, you know all over not only in the private sector all over we need to reach the unreached patients in slums, in tribal populations, those who are vulnerable due to um, comorbidities or conditions that predispose to TB. Drug resistant TB, I gave you a, a brief but complete picture of how smart the pathogen is. Doesn't need horizontal, or horizontal gene transfer. It is capable of generating mutations to actually uh, do away with every drug available. Comorbidities we need to be careful about. We need to screen these patients often to pick the disease early to offer them treatment early under nutrition overcrowding which unluckily we uh, our country does suffer from lack of awareness and poor health seeking behavior leading to delays in diagnosis so early diagnosis early treatment complete treatment and care of the vulnerable are the tenets of um, uh, tb care and here i bring in uh, the the four wise monkeys instead of three wise monkeys. So this concept is an age-old concept and Gandhiji alluded to three wise monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. Do no evil was of course not part of the Gandhiji's three monkeys but what we need here is eyes and ears all around, look around, advise the needy, stay aware, advise the needy. So you need to use your ears and eyes if you see a patient, you know, so the, the comorbid patients, those who are in overcrowded conditions, poor nutrition and so on, your advice possibly will save lives. And instead of, you know, just being, uh, you know, so you need to be proactive. Don't turn a blind eye. That's very important. Knowledge of TB, knowledge of diagnosis of TB, knowledge of treatment of TB, you could spread around and actually help a lot of patients and help reduction of acquisition of drug resistance to TB. Thank you so much.
So I uh, was trying not to overshoot the time given to me. So um, that I have alluded to the TV elimination program, trying to do an immense uh, good quality work. But here, like I'm requesting everybody to uh, join hands with the TB program. So how can we actually help the community? One, of course, you uh, advise patients who need uh, to come to the program and take treatment, advise them to, you know, to get diagnosis, get treatment, and so on and so forth. Uh, so in addition to giving free treatment, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, our country is actually excelling at, uh, if we could actually help patients by uh, improving their nutrition, giving them suggestions for, you know, if they're living in an overcrowded condition, if, uh, you know, you can advise if a TB patient is there and he can be given, um, uh, you know, due care, he can be taken to the program. So government launched, our, our president launched uh, in the month of September, uh, Nikshay Mitra program, the health minister and the president uh, launched it together. The idea is that if all of us could actually offer a helping hand, so that, that is why the name Nikshay Mitra. Nikshay program actually records uh, all TB patients' data, diagnosis, uh, treatment, and so on. If they fail, if the treatment is modified due to any reason, all that is recorded on the Nikshay program. So the Nikshay Mitra could be anybody, could be an individual, could be an organization. If the patient is, is, doesn't have a job, uh, or he's economically, uh, he needs support. Uh, organizations could offer them, uh, you know, a job, uh, uh, support, uh, not really. So economic support if possible, but if not that, at least the patient should not be considered as an outcast. Some people would possibly ask a patient to leave uh, uh, the job if he has TB. Of course, it's an airborne uh, infection, but what we need to do is give them a supporting hand rather than actually neglecting these patients. So all of us, could do our part, we could join hands and, uh, you know, bring the patients to the program, ensure that they complete treatment. So TB treatment does lead to some, um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, drug uh, reactions and the patient may have uh, uh, what we call as dilly. Uh, so he may have liver involvement, he may have issues for which he may actually abandon treatment. That is what we need to encourage the patient not to do. So there are drugs which could be uh, you know, the treatment could be altered, which we could give some other treatment in the meantime. His condition will improve, but he should never leave. So he's infected with a pathogen which is so capable of, you know, finding uh, a way around uh, uh, the drugs. I mean, the drug resistance is something that is inherent to the TB bacteria. So the only thing patients should do is stick to treatment. And what we could do is help our, uh, our uh, uh, you know, compatriots give them a helping hand in every possible way we can offer uh, any kind of support, even emotional support. Like I said, don't uh, let them feel as outcasts, that kind of emotional support, economic support, support for food, and, you know, convince them to complete treatment. That is the most important thing and uh, what we could all contribute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I think it was wonderful presentation by the four speakers of our department and they could really highlight the importance of uh, emerging antimicrobial resistance which is another pandemic which we are going to face and also um, about the antimicrobial stewardship how we can really uh, join hands together and work towards uh, this particular goal. So towards that I would like to request each one of you present here or those who are listening to at least adopt one patient of tuberculosis as Miksha Mitra and um, you know health ministry is really looking forward to the support and uh, if you can adopt even one patient and support in whatever way we can I think if this will be a big help to all these people who are suffering so with that, with that appeal uh, I would like to close today's um, you know the series of lectures by Department of Microbiology on Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Thank you very much.